I am thrilled to welcome Shiva Rajaraman. Shiva Rajaraman is currently VP of Product at OpenSea, the world's largest NFT marketplace. Previously, he led commerce at Meta, helping direct to customer brands reach new customers via new experiences, such as live shopping, product drops, and creator shops. Prior, he led technology at WeWork, where he launched a new on-demand space offering and received a masterclass in the importance of governance. Earlier, he was VP of product at Spotify, where he helped usher in an era of personalization, new product experimentation, and expansion into new formats, including podcasts. He spent much of his early career at Google and YouTube, helping people discover entertainment, education, and inspiration created by anyone for everyone. He's most passionate about helping underserved artists and developers build a community and make a real living doing it. Shiva is joined by Vijay Karuna Murthy, Head of Engineering at Scale. Vijay, over to you. Welcome, Shiva. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Vijay. Good to see you. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll jump right into it um, and really to talk about your career. Um, you've built a very crazy, impressive resume um, over the last decade or so of your career. I'm really starting with the early days of building product at YouTube and defining the future of user-generated content um, to going on to, to shaping the future of music at Spotify, your work at Metacommerce, your work at WeWork. What really drew you to OpenSea and what was the line of connection among all these huge roles you played in your career? Yeah, I reflect on this a lot, actually. I've been to <laughs> too many different places. I've been an ethnographer of the space. Uh, and so secretly writing a book, I would say. But the, the truth is, is that if you look at the theme that unites a lot of these things, it's go to a place where there's a bunch of creativity and technical talent is starting to swarm in. And usually that's for a few different dimensions. One is democratizing access and distribution. That's what YouTube represents. That's where we first met. And then you can go further and you start to look at places like Meta with commerce, which is helping any small business go online, particularly during the time of COVID. And then finally, places like WeWork, which is democratizing access to space for small businesses and creating a network around them. And a lot of fun stories around that too. But when you look at OpenSea, it's yet another example of that. You have a lot of really interesting creators, particularly artistic ones, and those that can build a community around their passion. They're starting to build here. The unit economics around this are very interesting for those creators. And they're able to do it in many ways by inventing a whole new identity for themselves, right? Which is fundamental. The privacy aspects of the space are interesting. And you tap that with a lot of the transparency and portability and composability that the blockchain offers. There's a real interesting revolution here, which is people being able to remix each other's projects and create a bigger ecosystem than what you could do through normal partnerships. So for me, it's like, wow, there's a lot of really creative, cool people in this space. And now we've seen a lot of technical talent swarm there. And that's usually the path I tend to follow and uh, got very excited about it. That's great. I love those terms, transparency, composability. Can you spell a little bit about what that means for you and how it yeah, relates to Yeah, let me break it down. Because I, I do feel like one of the things that haunts Web3 right now is terms and philosophies and sometimes dogma without examples, right? And so let's start with transparency, which is, let's say I'm a fan of an awesome creator. And that creator gives all their super fans a drop as an NFT. Well, now I own that NFT. You may not know who I am, but you know X wallet holds this NFT. This is a super fan of, let's say, Taylor Swift. Okay, and now you know that about me, and not me personally, but you know that person exists. And so, as a result, now the world can see that. And maybe there's ten thousand of such fans, and maybe there's activity around those NFTs or activity that is taken in different apps, distributed apps out there, and recorded in that NFT. So the result is now I can see this cool population. So that's the transparency side. The second piece of it is composability, really, which is like you built a cool NFT, a project. Maybe it's a piece of art, maybe it's a badge, maybe it's an actual application, but I now have that. Now, what if everyone else is super excited about that fan base? They can create value that the NFT can be a ticket for, 
without actually having to talk to anyone about that. And effectively what that means is they can compose a whole new experience. So let's say that was a gaming NFT that's a player in a game. I can go play that game that the community is building, but someone else could build a game for those same characters. And now I could play in that too, which is also a really interesting feedback when it comes to the original community. So that's super cool in the space. And then, you know, there's a fundamental primitive as well, which is ownership, which is, hey, now if I take that NFT, and let's say it's a profile picture, and I really kind of want that to be my identity. I know it's unique, and because it's recorded on the blockchain, it's you know that I actually do own it. So that's also an interesting layer here, which is to say we don't have to trust anyone for that, and it can be a permissionless model to build on top of it. That's where this world gets interesting. Great. You're getting into some of the product areas that it seems like you're passionate about, and I know that OpenSea is the world's first and largest Web3 marketplace for NFTs and crypto collectibles. What are your core focus areas as a VP of product at OpenSea? Well, there's, there's a range of things, and so I put them into kind of three camps, okay? Camp one is, what do we need to do as a marketplace, as a set of foundations that is really critical for the space overall? Those are things like security, right, and leaning into trust and safety, which really excited about the partnership we have on that, for example. The second piece of it is servicing effectively a group of the early adopters in the space. These are heavy collectors. These are folks that might have hundreds of NFTs and are basically you know, trading them with others all the time and starting to build a collection and care about that deeply. This group of people, right, affectionately called DGENs, right, in the space, are people who actually obsess about it. So a lot of our focus also goes into how do we serve them better? Like what are different types of protections, but also offer types and different mechanisms that we can have that are core to the marketplace, whether it's analytics all the way down to, you know, collection offers, which is something we launched recently. You put those things together, we're giving them more power tools and insights. Then you have a third camp, which I put as the next million, okay? And we're still early enough to where the next million matters a lot more than the next billion, in my opinion, which is we're still proving out utility and use cases. But this is where I'm increasingly spending more of my time, which is how do we surface the best of this world to people? How do we make this stuff more engaging? And how do we make it more transparent what the utility is behind an NFT versus just speculative aspects of it? You've led product teams in what we now call the Web2 world, and you've seen how passionate user bases can be there and how a focus on growth can pay dividends. How does the product role now differ for you in a Web3 startup environment? Ah, well, okay. One is just, let's just call it pure laziness of when I was in Web2, which is like, I take infrastructure for granted, right? Like, there's a long time ago where I actually had to care too much about what's happening fundamentally behind the scenes in terms of you know storage and transport and what's actually happening to make a database record effectively happen that was completely obfuscated appropriately so in that environment but in this world one of the things is like you do need to understand the sauce a lot more and get and you have to understand that i'll give you a good example which is in Web 2, your goal is to get rid of everything behind the scenes and make it a one-click experience, right? We've got one-click shopping. You know, I go into YouTube, it auto-plays videos for me, right? Like, you know, recommendations, et cetera, all are in play. In Web 3, because you have this also interaction with the blockchain, if you make an order or a bid, that might last for a long time there. You have to be conscious of that. So one of the things that you should change yourself when you're in this world is like, what does the user now need to know about the complexity behind the scenes versus what can you obfuscate and make very simple and transparent? And there's always a tension there, I would say, because we're still educating people on things. So that's also been a very unique change here. And then the third thing, which I don't think should be surprising, and it's probably not so Web3 specific, it's actually the way all development is working. You see this with enterprise companies quite a bit too. Your users, particularly your developers often, or consumers of a service, you really have to build a community around that. It's not just about like, hey, here's a utility for you, thank you, goodbye, right? People have developer groups and they wanna meet up and they wanna have visibility into your roadmap. They want to shape your roadmap, right? They wanna be heard. 
And so when you put all of that stuff together, in a weird way, Web3 is probably very similar to the best of enterprise, which is that was always a motion in enterprise, right? We had conferences and get people together and sharing tips, tricks, extensions, etc. That world is fundamental in this world. I would argue that many Web2 companies in some ways had that initially, but as they scale to billions, they lost touch of their community. Whereas you have to bring that DNA back to you when you start in Web3. Great. Great. You said we need to understand the sauce a little bit. So maybe now we're going to get into the recipe where, where the magic actually happens. Um, OpenSea is really you know, focused a lot on security features and protecting users from issues that can crop up with NFTs. And you also have a, a strong background in machine learning, having built machine learning teams during your career. What are some of the ways today where you're using machine learning to aid in those trust and safety features that you know are, are an important piece of this recipe? Yeah. So let's back up so I'll give you the context so you can understand it well. And one of the key things with NFTs is that often it looks like a luxury segment. In other words, the value per item is pretty high, right? And what that typically does is like invites a lot of copycats out there. So, and we call this in our world copy mints. So effectively you've got an NFT, someone has minted an exact copy of that and is trying to dupe someone into buying that copy, maybe at a much lower price, but still at a high price that makes the effort worth it. So if you step back, one of the key things we're doing with machine learning is making sure that we can detect those copycats at scale. So the way you can see this is, hey, I've got a bunch of images. Those images effectively come from what are reference collections. These are verified accounts and badge collections on our site. And if we see copycats coming in, we just stop them at the point of mint, which is the best time to do it. Now. Normally, this might be pretty easy. Just look for a similarity match and be okay with it. But remember what I talked about earlier, which is this is also a culture that promotes and you know has huge accolades around remixes. And so you have to be really careful here, which is like your precision has to be fairly narrow. But you know, if someone rotates an image, flips it, does immaterial changes to that thing, it's probably not a valid remix. But there are situations where a remix can look very similar to the originals, but they're adding new traits, right? We're creating effectively composites in a way that's appreciated by the community. And it's appreciated because the more people who are remixing your work, the more valuable the original work is too in this community, as long as they're not straight up spoofs. So one of the really interesting things here is how can we train models that delineate between, hey, this is just a copy of something versus this is a valid remix. And that's an interesting one and we're just on that journey. But, um, you know, our, obviously working together, we're seeing a lot of like hits and misses on this because we're learning together. But that's pretty exciting. And that's one of the fundamental challenges for us right now. Oh, that's interesting. Do you find when you talk to customers and you talk about trust and safety initiatives that you're driving and the role that ML plays, is it something that the community understands, you know, this is the, the common language that you need to speak in order to be able to address these issues and, and the approaches that you take um, and, and the, the ways in which you speak about these problems are, are something that resonate with the community? Yeah, I think one of the key things, and we're, we're still learning and on this journey, is that engaging with this community is often the more you can get to like real examples of this is just important. And whether it's fueled by machine learning, whether it's, you know, kind of like steeped in like technological solutions, I think at the end of the day, the output should be very explainable at this point in time. If it's not, explainability is like a key principle, I would argue. What that means is like being able to go to the community early you know, take what you're trying to do, make it visible, make it visceral to the extent that it, like if there's winners and losers in this thing, be really honest about it and share, get their input on how we should approach these things because, and bring them along for the journey. That's really important in this space. The second piece of it is that, remember there's a lot of urgency here too. There are new creators who, you know, their livelihood is now based on this. It's not a hobby. And the result of that is that there's urgency to make action, right? So one of the key things we've been doing is like, let's move fast, right? 
and roll out in chunks so that people see the impact and then quickly get that feedback in and iterate very quickly. That's not always the case with a lot of ML efforts in this world. They're often very slow, they're methodical, right? And I think in our case, it's just such a moving state and their urgency is high. It's important to make a leap forward rather than slow things down too much. But in, accordingly, you have to engage actively with every step. That's great. You talk about a sense of urgency, and I have to imagine one reason for that is just how quickly OpenSea has grown. That you're now the world's largest platform for NFTs and Web3 creations. You've reached a huge number of creators and collectors very quickly. Have you used operational AI, which are machine learning and human loop techniques, as a tool that you've relied upon to scale your business and your platform to meet that growth? Yeah, I think like, well, one, for example, in this in this particular case, like a lot of human labeling is necessary, right, to make it work. And that's important. And we're still a very small team for what it's worth. So, you know, working with partners is critical, but more fundamentally, we don't know what we don't know yet. So I think one of the key things we try to do is really have a system that's very heavily human in the loop, and then we can expand from there and scale. So we're obviously working on things like copy mint that are at the scale stage, not at the early kind of like feed this thing and figure out what's going on. But as we look at new types of use cases, and there's always new ones coming, right? It becomes interesting to, to start with a lot of, I would say, operational support, right? That can feed the velocity of training. But the other side of it is having just excess capacity to deal with anomalies that will come up so that we're not slowed down because we're waiting for an algorithm to learn the anomalies, we can do that with people. So that's really the extent of what we're doing. I think there's a lot we can do, uh, frankly, operationally throughout the ecosystem, but you know, for example, you can think about pricing, right? You can think about bid management for some of these power users and things like that. But I think we're still premature for some of that. I think the truth is, is that we're trying to create a product that's much more self-serve, right? You could do more things yourself, once we see what's happening in that way, then I think we can get to a pretty interesting um, um, a set, of, a set of vectors we can scale over time. That's great. There's a great point about how there are a lot of interesting use cases that you're seeing for NFTs. And one example that we're seeing is that NFTs now define virtual identities and virtual worlds, some of which look so insanely fun that they're becoming viral on social media and we're all finding out about them. As you find more dynamic content being hosted on OpenSea, what new data problems are you tackling? Uh, okay, so, well, I think there's a few things. So NFTs are just a container in many ways. They're like a primitive. So anything can happen here. It's basically a wrapper. Here's clear ownership around it. I can understand like how it was transacted or could be transacted. And so anything can happen there. So. To answer your question, I think one of the biggest things we, we struggle with, and it's gonna be a very big, interesting opportunity for the space, is how do you classify this content or this, this stuff, right? And I'm not just talking about like, what does this image look like? I'm thinking about different dimensions on this front. One is stuff you can observe, which is actually the graphical content or an experience that's there, a video, whatever it might be. Um, you can look at the price, right? You can look at the activity in terms of it's like trading and transfer volume and things like that. But there's another side of it of like what's behind the scenes? What utility does this unlock? You know, it's NFT can be a form of self-expression, which is some really cool ones, which is, hey, here's my character. Here's my profile pic now on Twitter. Here's how I can use it in different games. And here's how it manifests my identity. That's cool. But maybe it could be unlocking a membership or a subscription. It could also be effectively, you know, a true utility. Maybe you burn it for some value and things like that. So there's a lot of different things here that aren't always captured cleanly in metadata, in the contract, and sometimes they're just written on websites. So it's a question of should we resolve all of that through crawling and, you know, ingesting data or through our APIs we could produce? Or is there an opportunity perhaps to create a metadata and utility standard on chain that more and more people subscribe to? And obviously I lean in that direction, which would help solve the data gaps, but also that's good because that's a standard that is coupled with the NFT on the blockchain and is therefore immutable and has some rules and, you know, some dependability that otherwise you would not have. 
But right now, I would say this, the way to put it is that you've got the stage of the NFT, and you've got a lot of stuff backstage. And the backstage stuff is really hard to understand right now, which makes classification or discovery challenging. Great. What you just said sounds incredibly exciting. A, a metadata standard on chain. Do you, do you want to go into more detail on, on what you have? And if you want to launch any future products here at TransformX, feel, feel free to do that. <laughs> well, I think this, like everything in this space, I think it's something the community is really excited about, including us at OpenSea. But what, let's take a look at a subset of this, just utility. Let's take, it, let's take it down to something we can all understand. Even, let's say my NFT is a ticket to an event. Next scale event, you give everyone an NFT. There's a lot of things that can happen there. For example, it's not that it's necessarily a revolution on the ticketing system, but it's like, now I've got you know, a proof that I attended this event. And maybe that NFT unlocks highlights or moments, or maybe based on where I checked in or what contributions I had, I get a different NFT that's evolved as a result. It could be pretty cool. It could be just something that it's like just a fun badge of honor. So let's say that's the case. Okay, now let's say also you're like, look, you know, maybe I'm also okay with people reselling their ticket. They don't want to come. But you might want to set rules around that, right? Like you can't resell it once the event has started, right? You can't, once you've redeemed and you've gone in, you can't go send it to your friend to come in behind you. Maybe as part of redeeming it or selling it, you still need to, for security and relationship purposes, you know, understand who that person is who got, who's coming into your conference. There's a lot of different mechanics around this. So one way to look at this is like, what if that is standardized in some way? And would the world benefit in terms of adoption because a standard could say, here's the different elements you have, here's what needs to be populated, here's the rules that need to be set, they might be optional, but this will make it easy for anyone to interpret and effectively manage that access accordingly. So interested in that, utility is even more interesting, like what benefits do I get out of this? Can I only redeem them once? Or are they, like can the next buyer of the NFT also redeem them? There's things like that that are confusing in the space and end up showing up in fine print everywhere. It'd be nice if that was the standard. And then if you step back at broader metadata, it's like traits, and, you know, utility that's unlocked and a variety of different aspects of what this application is as an NFT that could be better defined, right? And we don't have a great schema for that in the world. So that could be an interesting thing to work on. So without revealing anything in the roadmap, I think it's more that everyone in the space is really curious about these topics. And it would be important for some of the principal actors in the community to work together to make this happen. Great. I realize I'm here today with one of the individuals that's shaping the future of NFTs and this broader Web3 space. And so I would be remiss in not asking you, what are the, the major trends that you see shaping the future of AI and NFTs? And in addition to yourself, who are the other individuals that are shaping your thinking the most as you think about the next five to 10 years of what oh, the future yeah. holds? Well, let me start with who's shaping the thinking, because I think that's that's fascinating. I do work with, you know, Devin and Alex, who are the co-founders of OpenSea, obviously bet on this in the true, true toddlers days, if not infants days of this experience. So they have so much in terms of, it's weird, it's still like a relatively short period of time, but there's so much history and density of learnings and insights. and why things ended up this way. Because if you come in new to the space, you're typically like, whoa, why is it like this, right? And, and it's sometimes hard to grok that without having that history. So that's important. And they're both really good guides, teachers, et cetera. We've also now just got a leadership team that's you know at least six months into it, at most one year into it, right? So like, it's very been interesting to see how fast that learning curve is. But I think this is also important. We often come from different backgrounds and different points in history of the internet. So some of our lessons apply here. Like there's things that I've learned from YouTube and Spotify that have immediate corollaries in the space. And there's stuff where they absolutely don't apply. We have to reverse it. So what has been interesting is working with that team kind of to challenge things. And we're the kind of team that, you know, there's no stupid questions. We really mean that in this space. But also there's a question of, you know, 
well, what should we be thinking of that maybe someone who's completely steeped in Web3 is not thinking about, right, entirely? Like, scale protections for copy mint is a good example of that, where it's a long history of these things, but there's unique Web3 variants of it. So that's one. So I'm surrounded by really good people, and that community extends outside of the open sea walls because a lot of my friends, former colleagues, as well as just learning from the community. So I learn a lot, and this is really important. I have my DMs open on Twitter and I just get random like thoughts, ideas, things that are broken, things that are confusing. And I would say that's been the most educational ride of them all. There's no one, now it's funny because like every single one of those DMs now is effectively an NFT character being me, right? Like no one's real face is there at all. And so it's like a hilarious group of followers that I've got now, but they're also very direct, super authentic and have, zero hesitancy about sharing their strongest opinion, which is really valuable, I think. And perhaps anonymity helps with that to some degree, but I do think that's super interesting. Now, going back to the trends question, that's a fascinating one. I think one of the key things is, I would say right now what NFTs and a lot of Web3 represents is these so-called profile pick collections, these PFPs. So you'll hear Doodles or Board Ape Yacht Club and things like that. And what those have started to do is they started out as communities, PFPs. They generated, obviously, accelerated in value. But now they're starting to become almost like media companies. So they're, they've, you know, Doodles is a good example, right? You've got Pharrell now as their chief creative officer. They're spinning up a movie, yeah, you know, movies, a music label, all kinds of interesting things. So they're taking this IP, character driven, turning it into stories in different media and formats. And that's interesting, both for the original holders, but now you're going to see people consuming that who are not owners, per se, or might own a derivative or a sliver of that work. And that's a really interesting thing. So you can think of them as trying to build Disney from the ground up, and that's super interesting. Now, there's a second area, which is, okay, what about just generally the creator to fan relationship? That's what I was excited about. Um, NFTs give creators a way to offer disproportionate value to their super fans and price that accordingly, right? And that's a really interesting spectrum that ad supported and part to some extent subscriptions solve this, but not entirely. And that's a really interesting kind of area to play with. And then you go further, now you're starting to talk about those fundamental things, ownership, transparency, portability and composability that make this stuff really sort of interesting now. How do those building blocks come together? That one, I think, is still kind of like open space. You know, I try to be, try to be sober versus like enthusiastic about everything, but I think there's some really interesting things that can happen there that aren't just the future of the fan club, but could get into the idea that, hey, now I'm owning a, you know, I'm renting something, but now I have ownership in it as well. And I have a liquid way potentially to let that ownership go on once I'm done with this situation, but I have stake for what I've invested in that community property, etc. So I'm really interested in these things that are fundamental economic shifts, right, to the way that we might normally be an owner or a renter, right? And there's no blurry line in between them. I think that could be a really interesting chasm to use NFTs to cross. Now that I know your DMs are open, you will also find me joining into your Greek chorus of NFT characters that, that pick you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> great. You mentioned storytelling and the example from Doodles is a great one where they're, they're leveraging this IP in brand new ways. We've also seen in this past year in the AI space some really powerful AI capabilities to create images and other forms of imagery that people didn't expect a, a year ago. Do you see AI as empowering some of these creators and storytellers with new capabilities they didn't have before? Yeah, I actually think this is one of the, the most under under talked about things that's happening right now and or or maybe the negative aspects are particularly highlighted like deep fakes right but i think one of the most interesting things happening right now is that i mean if you grow up as a kid we all make up stories right we all have like you know fantasies that we sketch on paper we play with our you know dolls for and create a world right but not all of us end up having those artistic capabilities once we get older, but we definitely still have those ideas. And I think at some point, those ideas start to fail us or not be a part of our fundamental lives 
that creativity because we don't have the tools to go from idea in our head to paper, clay, you know, computer model, etc. And so what's really interesting in this world is that that linkage, those tools, the superpowers are being unlocked through AI. So we've already seen this with like, you know, obviously some of the great image renderer stuff that's going out there, etc. But effectively, what we're getting to a point of is like, I think of a really cool story. I'm going to describe that story in whatever ways I can with as much precision as I can. And then AI will take it the rest of the way. And then I might tweak it and shape it, et cetera. But we're all becoming these puppeteers, right? Puppet masters, I should say. And it's sort of interesting on that. And that is like what this world is about to go through. With that comes a lot of responsibility, trust and safety issues, all this kind of stuff. But generally, like more technologies, I think we're going to see a lot of beauty and really like, you know, people who can't afford the tools or education. That's a problem but they can't do it now, that's about to be in their fingertips. And so I'm very excited about what comes out of that because the belief again, just like going back to the early days of YouTube is that there are more creators who just can't reach their audience because there's a gatekeeper in front of them. I would argue the same thing. There's really fascinating creators who have awesome ideas, but the gate in front of them is they don't have access to the tools or education to make those stories come to life. And AI could be an empowering force for that. You used the term democratizing earlier, and it feels like this is part of that trend where AI is democratizing and removing the gates that gatekeepers used to hold in front of individuals. And it feels like in the NFT space, you're also leveraging this trend of democratizing the power of creation, the power of storytelling. Is that a trend that you see you know, across all creators that you work with as something over the next few years? Yeah, it? I would say like... You know, democratization has been a theme that's been running through the history of the internet and well before that too. Like every new technology has usually enabled a group of people who often didn't have a level of playing field because to have that playing field and have access to it because technology generally was about productivity a lot of the times, so giving you access to that productivity at cheaper prices, right? And then it became distribution with the internet. So that's pretty exciting. One thing you'll hear in Web3 is democratization and decentralization go together. And part of that is because, well, one of the issues with democratization is that it doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't, your personal roadmap of achievements might be dependent on a single platform's alignment with their interests as well. If a large platform that you work with is only interested in ads for a long period of time, but maybe what's revenue optimizing for you is subscriptions, right? It's sometimes hard to take your audience and move them somewhere else that will support that. You get locked in. And I'm not saying that's completely that, you know, walled garden, but it does have some elements of that. So what's interesting with decentralization, too, is that you are the creator. Here's your community. And it's very easy using something like an NFT to gain access to all these platforms or reach that same community with equivalent benefits without having to reset the clock on them as a fan based on proprietary data in one platform. So being able to move that in a very different way is potentially also fueling democratization, but it's through the mechanism of decentralization and making sure someone who sprouts here can thrive here without having to pay a price. Great. You've mentioned how much of your leadership team has joined in the last year, so I realize this is a pretty compressed period of time, but what key lessons have you learned during the last year or during your time at OpenSea? Um, what really stands out in your mind as being a lesson that you would carry forward um, to future work that you do? Right, yeah, Oof, there's a lot, okay, but let me start with, in our world, there's just no harm, and again, is this like a strong lesson here, just like a pattern that's amplified. Say, I always knew this in throughout my career, anytime like I didn't take the time to talk to your community of users and or like understand the motivation for creators or consumers of things on your platform or service, like it's always a mistake. Like why not do that? That's really important. And often there's huge events that let you do those types of things. And a lot of times you see those as attacks, but really it should be a habit. So I do, for example, now at OpenSea, 
take the time to talk to, you know, two creators and some DGen users on a weekly basis. And I don't even do that as part of work. Sometimes I'll be like, hey, I'll meet someone. They, hey, you work at OpenSea. It's pretty cool. I was like, oh, do you collect NFTs? And they're, yeah. Well, let me, let me tell me what's wrong. Like, what's going on? What works for you? What are you scared about? What are you excited about? And that's just really revealing. And I'm just surprised how many times it's the most effective form of user research that there is, right? Obviously, it's a skilled profession. Lots you can do there. But if you just don't do that basic thing, it becomes a problem. So that's one. The second thing is, you know, again, I walked into this saying like, I can be, you know, I had my old habits, which is I can be more agnostic about the infrastructure. In this world, you have to go deep into the infrastructure. You have to understand it. What is something that you can shield and you try to obfuscate versus what do you need to reveal and educate on? That's very important in the space. And so getting really deep and understanding to some extent, not like coding, but understanding the technical underpinnings has been essential. And I've been spending more time on that. And it's not ceased since I've been in this role. I feel like that's really important to understand. And it's also a deep well that you have to go into. The third thing is, well, you've, I've learned that in new movements with new technology, particularly new kind of fundamental primitives, is that there's a lot of essential dogma that fuels that drive. And, but I'm joining at a point where I think being more sober about that is also important. So one of the things that I'm trying to do, right, and you know, maybe this talk is an example of trying to do this and hopefully succeeding, is that un, like explaining the utility in concrete ways is important. So we've got the initial one where this will come, build it and they will come, is like a really good mantra for the first few years of anything. But as you start to evolve beyond that, you've got to say, okay, what problems is concretely serving? Are we doing our best to surface that utility or benefit? And are we complementing the infrastructure or features that exist to really make that come to life? That's where the roadmap needs to really be like steeped. And my attention needs to be steeped as well as my team. So spending more time on that is really important. We've got to come out of this. It what might happen or it will happen definitively with confidence without being able to explain it, I think that's very important to shift into. Whereas in many other places, I think it was kind of obvious what the utility was. The question is, could you solve the distribution aspects of it? In this world, it's like, let's not even talk about distribution for a second. Let's talk a little bit more about, have we really nailed the utility? Do we have the right primitives? And a lot of these standards have been invented in the last year, right? So it's not like it's something that is steeped and you're just trying to tweak it and make it work, you're still fun, f trying to look for ground truth on what's actually real. And so shifting into that mentality is important versus staying too academic. For the record, I think you've been very successful at explaining all of these use <laughs> cases uh, in this interview. So uh, thank you for, for joining us for that. Um, you mentioned dogma that you might have inherited. And one thing I know about you is that you've held very strong opinions over the course of your career especially at places like YouTube and Spotify, oftentimes there were contrarian opinions that you held that others didn't, and you were proven out correct um, you know, over the course of many years. What's an insight that you have about OpenSea or an opinion that you hold about NFTs that few others might agree with you on, but you know for a fact is, is going to be true? Ah, okay. Well, I think the thing that I hold to be true is that it's not just about the economic value of an NFT that's really fundamental here. In other words, people are often talking about, you know, a crypto winter, and then all of a sudden, the speculative force that's been fueling a lot of this will just evaporate, right? And there is some truth to the fact that there was a lot of speculation, right? And that bubble may be burst, right? And I hope a lot of that speculative bubble is burst permanently. But what I do hold to be true is that if you're a creator, right, and you've been an underserved creator on the artistic side of it, or been a writer that hasn't seen your share of the downstream royalties, or maybe a songwriter that's, you know, underserved in this ecosystem, NFTs represent a way to rebalance that, but also grow the pie. And I think that's really important. A lot of people have been often talking about, like, you know, your top 1,000 fans versus like all your ad supported fans. And my point is like, 
Yeah, that makes sense, right? On a per like consumption unit basis, a stream is worth a lot less than buying one NFT. But I think you can potentially have both in this world. In other words, you can reward your super fans. You can give them a stake in something in the sense of like they feel like they are really proud to own this and show it off. Not an economic stake necessarily, but they really feel like this is valuable in and of itself and gives them access. But what comes out of that creativity can be consumed right for free by many different people. But now you control the funding of that, the distribution decisions around that, how royalties are distributed around that. That's an economic shift at that point. In fact, the things we have to do on distribution might need to catch up later, right? Or these things could be published to Web2 systems for distribution as long as those royalties flow in the right way. So one thing I do believe is that it's not just about collectibles, right? It is actually a set of primitives that let people own the way that they monetize their community and own special things they might be able to do to give other creators through collabs or participation in a project, you know, a very disproportionate share of the upside if they are critical to the early stages of that project versus what often happens in the world where regulatory regimes or the way deals have been done with bundles for a long time sets the profit sharing in a way that the artist can't control. So I think that's something that's pretty interesting here. Um, maybe it's not controversial yet, but I do think it's very unproven yet. So I think that's the key thing to focus on. Great. For a last question, I know you as a long-term thinker, someone who sees the future often before others have, and I've always been, been in a mindset of asking you questions about what's gonna happen in the next 10 years, 20 years, because I know you're one of the individuals that are thinking that far out. For the Web3 space, what's the one thing that you're most excited about that maybe you know our kids, grandkids might find out about Web3 that we've only just started to realize right now? Oh, yeah. I think one of the interesting things is that those kids and grandkids like might buy into a community and they're one of the first 100 holders of this and they're super passionate about what it represents. So maybe it's like a really cool collectible that, you know, has like really cute characters and turns into comic books and coloring books, but also gives them access to you know, family events and stuff like that. And really cool things. Like I, I own one such NFT and it's just, it's not high value, but it's super fun. And I think very family friendly too. And so that's cool. One of these kids is going to own one of those things. And one of those things is going to sprout out. And all of a sudden it's going to have theme parks around the world. Right? <laughs> I can, that will be really fun to say you were early in that community. You contributed to ideas, you voted on their roadmap, right? You really, really helped fuel and maybe co-create with them. And what was even better about it is that those kids will be saying, and by the way, you know, my friend's project over there collaborated with my project and we did something cool together that became even bigger than the original Sprout. So I'm hopeful that we have a bunch of people in the world, including kids and grandkids and all this, you know, folks out there who all of a sudden, again, speaking to some of the themes we talked about, finally are able to create and contribute to creative things, right? And that becomes their tribe in many ways. And as a result, they also see those things flourish because we have so many more creative ideas and ways to get into that system that eventually those end up turning into the future great brands of the world. Now, that's very hypothetical. I'm very excited about that. Practically, I think what would be really cool is that Everyone is just a member of a community that values their creative expression and contributions to it. That's simple. Even if it was super tiny and we all have one group we're a part of and whatever interest you might have, whether it's animation or sports or camping or teaching, you know, there's a place you can go contribute to the world's work and see that work, you know, reward back to the community, I think that'd be pretty cool. And so, whereas a lot of our world I feel is steeped in a lot of polarization right now, and a lot of that polarization, I don't know, is constructive in terms of creative output. Might be constructive in other ways, that's fine, I won't judge. But I do think we don't have as much rewards for creative passions in this world that are actually accessibly mainstream. Well, that idea of finding your tribe is so powerful and important. I, I'm very grateful to have you in my tribe. I'm, I'm very grateful that you're part of this ML tribe here, but thank you for, for all the insights and perspective that you've shared on this brand new and exciting space. 
Oh, my pleasure. Congrats on your role. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be reconnected with you. And it's been fantastic uh, having a new track too. Thank you, Shiva. And thank you for joining this conference. We've been super blessed to have your insights and perspective on this brand new space. And so hopefully we'll get to hear more from you over the next couple of months and years.